Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome. We're glad you are joining us here for our uh, program today. We are continuing our uh, series in the study of the book of Revelation, a a magnificent book in the Bible, but a book that has um, caused a lot of people to have a lot of questions. It's so full of so many mysterious things. I'm looking here at the materials that we have prepared and by Ken, and the title is uh, The Great Surprise. Um, Ken is going to tell you how you can get these materials on our website. We're going to be reading about a a woman and a strange woman and a strange beast. And Ken has asked me to begin with chapter 17, verse 6 in the book of Revelation. Verse 3. three, three to I'm, six. I'm sorry, verse uh, 3 to 6. And what we have here is John describing that he is uh, having a vision. God is carrying him off in a vision and what, what he is seeing here. So beginning in uh, verse 3, it says, and I read, The Spirit took control of me. This is John talking about his experience here. And the angel carried me into a desert. This is what he is seeing. There I saw a woman sitting on a red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones, and pearls. In her hand she held a gold cup, full of obscene and filthy things, the result of her immoral immor immorality. On her forehead was written the name that has a secret meaning, quotes, Great Babylon, the mother of all prostitutes and perverts in the world, unquotes. And I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they had been loyal to Jesus. Well, Ken, what are we going to do with this? Yeah, that's, a, that's a going to be a surprise, isn't it? Well, you remember if you were with us last week, that we were talking about plagues. And it says they will fall on those who, while they should know better and had, have had the opportunity to learn, have stubbornly persisted and refused to obey God's Ten Commandments and are instead determined to follow their own judgment and in the final events of this world's history are involved in efforts to actually murder God's faithful people. And here we just, Jay just read to us about that. And I have, I have a question okay. about this. In the book of Revelation, things are coming to an end, and there is disaster falling on the world and upon Christians, and basically, as we are interpreting this, Satan is kind of being turned loose so that we can see really what he is like. Mm -hmm. Haven't we studied before and read before and interpreted before that at the cross, we got a good look at what Satan was like, that, that he could take us humans and, and we would even take God and, and kill him ourselves. Isn't that, isn't that enough to, to see what this guy is like and what, you know, what it's all about? Why do we have to, why do we have to go into, into all of this final terrible just yeah, well, if we had all learned our lesson from what happened to Jesus, then this wouldn't be necessary. But we haven't. We're, we're back doing the same kinds of things again. So God says, well, I, we're going to go through it one more time. 
and this is going to be it. We're not going to do it ever again. So, while none of us know um, exactly how, what form each of the seven last plagues will take, it is clear that they will be devastating and deadly. They could not be worldwide or no one would survive. And Ellen White, one of the founders of the Adventist Church, said in Great Controversy, page 628, paragraph 2, these plagues are not universal or the inhabitants of the earth would be wholly cut off. Now, does that sound like something God would be doing or would there somebody else maybe be doing that? Yet there will be the most awful scourges that the, have ever been known to mortals. All the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. That's kind of scary, isn't it? We have raised the question about who is responsible for these plagues, these final plagues. Read superficially, the book of Revelation seems to point to God as the cause. Um, Revelation 15, the first couple of verses. Revelation 16, the first couple of verses. It seems like it's God acting. God's wrath, however, as we've learned from earlier in the Bible, is his realizing that there's nothing more that he can do for that person or group, and so he stands back, despite his love for them, and allows them to reap the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. It's interesting to notice in Revelation 12, 17, let's just look at that real quick. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Okay, so who is the object of Satan's activities here? The church. Basically, these are God's two people, isn't it? It's a more pure state. Um, several chapters go by. Well, first of all, let's notice... What does the dragon do when he's furious with the woman? Now we read up in, uh, and we, maybe we should look at that because we don't want there to be any confusion here. Back up a few verses in Revelation 12, verse 6. What does it say? I'm sorry, is it 12, verse 6? Yeah, the woman fled to the desert to a place God had prepared for her where she will be taken care of for 1260 days. The woman. And what, what do we know about this woman? She's given birth to the child which we take to mean Jesus because he's taken up to heaven, isn't he? So this must be a pure woman, right? Yeah. Seems like it. But we get down to verse 17, what happens? The dragon was furious with the woman and went off or disappeared to fight against the rest of her descendants. All those who obey God's commandments are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Okay, And if we read back in um, verse 12, I'm sorry, 13, when the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to earth, he began to pursue the woman who had given birth to the boy. She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert where she will be taken care of for three and a half years safe from the dragon's attack. But verse 17 says the dragon pursues her, right? He disappears. And we assume that he's pursuing her and he disappears. So where is he headed? Into the desert or some translations have the wilderness. So your translation might say wilderness. So the dragon, we see a pure woman who's given birth to Christ and then Christ is taken to heaven. She disappears into the desert or wilderness and then we find that the dragon's very angry so he starts pursuing her and he heads off. He disappears and we assume he's gone where? Into the desert, into the wilderness, right? So is this talking about when Mary and Joseph had to flee and went into Egypt? Well, no, because they come back and all that kind of stuff. This is, this, is, this is being pursued, they're being pursued, this woman is, is a symbol for the church. Ah. And because the, 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 a woman in the Bible usually refers to a church, I mean in Revelation particularly. So this, when it's, when it's describing this, 
if you took it literally, you, you could almost assume we're talking about Mary here, yeah. but it doesn't correspond, so yeah. we understand that uh, this, this is a symbolic term for right. the church. Right. Where did you get this point where the dragon disappeared? He went off. He went off? What does your version say at the beginning of verse, uh, what is that, verse 17? 17. 17. Middle. Dragon was furious. And the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off. Went off. war on her. To fight against the rest. Against, and the rest, the rest of her offspring. Right. So he went, the, he went for both. Yes. The woman and her offspring. Yes. Um, and we would take that to mean the, 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 the remnant of the church, right? Yes, pl plus the woman. Yeah. Both of them. Right. Exactly. So the remnant of the church, I, you just said it was the woman. I mean, the, the church well, was the woman. Okay. So now why is it separated? Because she's still the woman here that's the pure... Well, pure if we thing. take this to be the church, if you the woman, it, if we take it as a church, because that seems to be the, the way it's used in, in the book of Revelation. By the church, do you mean... The theological organization of the church, yeah. or are you talking about the people of the church? Well, I'm going to let you hold that question for a second because we're going to, we're going to find the great surprise here in a moment, okay? <laughs> Several chapters go by, and if you read chapter 14, 15, 16, until you get most of the way through 16, and there's no mention of the dragon at all. The surrogate powers, it talks about the beast, who has seven heads and ten horns, and it talks about the lamb horned beast, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth, etc. And all of a sudden, in Revelation 16, 13, we, we, and we spoke about this last time, then I saw three unclean spreads that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of, and there's the dragon again, the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet. And then we come down here to Revelation 17, that we're talking about now, and uh, what has the dragon been doing? He's been hiding behind his earthly surrogates. He's been letting them act in his behalf. And during the 1260 day prophecy, the three and a half years, Daniel, the 42 months, Revelation, all those are the same time period. What's happening to this pure woman that escaped into the desert? It appears that she's getting corrupt. Getting corrupt. She was in hiding. But, but and it's, during that time, she apparently became corrupt. But it says here she will be taken care of for 1260 days. So, She's, how is that being taken care of if the dragon all of a sudden gets a hold of her and corrupts her? Well, keep reading. Keep reading. Don't okay. stop. That's our mantra, okay? At the very end of this uh, Earth's history, Satan will do everything possible in his final desperate attempt to either confuse and tempt the righteous, or even in desperation, and ultimately to destroy them. Notice some of the things that he does to parallel God's true system. So let's think about this for a second. We have the devil, and he wants to take God's place. So how, what would you do if you wanted to take God's place? How would you, how would you go about that? Well, you'd have to convince a lot of people, presumably, that you deserve to belong in God's place, right? And you couldn't just get it by, you could, he couldn't get it by telling the truth. No. And he couldn't get it by just lying. He had to mix some truth. You have to sugarcoat the truth. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, sugarcoat the lies with some truth mm -hmm. to make it palatable. And he convinced, it says in Revelation 12, there a third of them. Revelation 13. Well, oh. 12 and 13, yeah. 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 talks about his confusing. Yeah, well, third, third uh, uh, early part of the chapter yeah. 12 here. Yeah, but yeah. Revelation 13, he comes down to this earth and he convinces almost everybody. Yeah. Well, it said the whole world wonder, wor wondered wonder. after and then it beast. says they worship the beast. So if the masses are going one direction in, in worship, truth must be the other direction. Yeah. So is it the whole world? Well, it's... I mean, we're being literal here, so... Significant number. It, whole, says, it says the whole world. The I understand. World. Except. except. You get down to verse 8, it says, except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So there is a small exception. It's referred to as a remnant. Yeah. 
accept. <laughs> oh, you got it circled. <laughs> sure you must have asked the question before. <laughs> well, okay, so Satan says, I want to be God. So what does he try to do? He says, let me see if I can imitate God as close as possible. So God has a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know that, right? The devil has his trinity. What is his trinity? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation 16, 13. God has his throne in heaven. We know about that. The beast also has a throne. Revelation 13, 2 and 16, 10. There it is. Jesus received a mortal wound and died on Calvary, was buried, and then rose from the grave. The leopard-bodied beast in Revelation 13 receives a mortal wound, but is later healed. Revelation 13, verse 3. So, I mean, how is he, is he, is he imitating God or what? In the book of Revelation, God is described as one who is, who was, and who is to come. Suggesting that he has always existed and will someday come back to this earth. The devil claims to be like God, but he is described as a beast who was once alive, but lives no longer, is about to come up from the abyss and will go off to be destroyed. Revelation 17, 8. So, I mean, how close is that? Christ's name, Michael the Archangel, means who is like God. The people who worship the beast ask, who is like the beast? Revelation 13, 4. The Holy Spirit leads his followers into all truth. The false prophet, otherwise known as the lamb-horned beast, teaches lies and persuades people or tries to force them to worship the leopard-bodied beast. Revelation 13, 11 to 17. I mean, He's imitating God every way he possibly can. God created men and women in his own image. Satan creates an image to the beast. Revelation 13, 14. God breathed into man the breath of life, Genesis 2, 7. Satan's trinity breathes life into an image of the beast, Revelation 13, 15. God sends three angels to carry the final message as a warning to this earth, Revelation 14, 6 to 12. The devil responds with three frogs which are evil spirits coming forth from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation 16, 13. They will assemble the nations for the great battle against God and his followers. Shall I go on? God offers every one of us his seal. Revelation 7, 1 to 3, 14, 1 to 5. Satan encounters with the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 16, and 17. I mean, it's incredible. God's remnant faithfully keep his commandments even under threat of their lives. Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12. Satan also has a remnant. They choose to believe his lies. They have been convinced that they do not need to keep God's law. They should not keep it and they cannot keep it. They will end up in the lake of fire. Revelation 19, 19 and 21. We haven't got there yet, but it's coming. The Greek word parousia describes the coming or presence of the Holy Spirit among God's people. The Holy Spirit works miracles through his apostles and prophets. Satan's parousia is described in Revelation 16, 14 and Revelation 13, 11 to 17, will perform great signs even making fire come down from heaven. These are Satan's signs and wonders. It's that 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. I mean, it's... I mean, the list goes on and on. Satan's biggest lie was in the Garden of Eden when he said, you will not die, Genesis 3, 4. Christ's truth is that he resur resurrected people from the dead, John 11. Satan will pretend to talk to and through the dead to try to prove, as the serpent taught, that people do not really die. Great Controversy 552, 560, and LDA, one six, uh, Last Day Events 161, paragraph 4. The coming of Christ will be with every possible sign. Every eye will see him, Revelation 1-7. He will come in the clouds with the trumpet blast and the archangel's voice, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17. There will be lightning that flashes from the east across the sky, Matthew 24, 27. Satan's parousia, or coming, takes several forms. One of them is the idea that we will be secretly raptured. And where is this list found? <laughs> yeah, if you didn't get all those verses written down and you'd like to find them in, on the, in the handout that we prepared, you can find it on our website. That's www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. If you didn't get a chance to copy down all those verses and you'd like to look at them, it's amazing what Satan has done to try to imitate God.
If you say, well, I was dead, and I'm right, yeah, well, I was that. If I was, if, oh yeah, I was that, okay, yeah, you have your trinity, I have mine. I mean, it went on and on. The earthly surrogates, are they like the tares that grew among the wheat, uh, pretending to be like uh, sons of God, when in fact they're sons of the Satan? Well, let's think about that. If you wanted to imitate God as close as possible, and you wanted an earthly surrogate to do your will here on this earth, you would look at God. What does God have here on this earth? That's the sad part. The scary part yeah. is that he tries to make us and succeeds in some cases, many cases, of, of making humans like him. I mean, God does. Well, Satan, Satan, Satan well, does. Well, but hold on. I asked you the question. First of all, let's look at God's side. What does God claim here on this earth? What does he say, I have on this earth? God says, I have a people on the earth. I have a people, and he calls it his what? Remnant. His remnant. He calls it a church. Ecclesia, those who are called out, right? He has a remnant people, sometimes referred to as a church. Now, if, if Satan were going to have an imitation of God, he wants to imitate as close as possible, what would he have? A church as well. <laughs> he would have a false church, a church that comes close to teaching the truth, but mixes in just enough falsehood so it's not the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what he would, isn't that what you would expect after all these things we've read about Satan? So does Satan have his church? Yes. And all well, the others. And all the others, huh? All the other churches, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we ought to check that out. Look, look at Revelation 13. Let, let, let's be fair here. Let's be fair. Look at Revelation 13. And I'm going to go back to the beginning of that chapter. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown. On each of its heads was a name that was insulting to God. Now, is this God's church? Certainly, I hope not. Yeah. The beast looked like a leopard with a feet like bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth. Where did we run across leopards, bears, and lions before? Daniel. In the book of Daniel, didn't we? And what were they? If you look at those, that was the nation of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Greece. Those are the three. And then there's the nondescript beast that we, we say is Rome. But there was those three, and here's a beast that's combining the characteristics of all three of those. Furthermore, if you count them all up, they had seven heads among all those beasts and ten horns. So what we have here is a collective representation of military religious groups in the Old Testament who oppressed, conquered, and enslaved God's people, right? Isn't that what we have here? So this is, and what would Satan like to do? Do the same thing. He would like to make this church the dominant one, wouldn't he? He would like to make it the biggest church in the world. He'd like it to, he would like it to include everybody, right? Has and he six all the world is wandering, wandering after the beast, it sounds like he's going to be succeed at that. Well, let's read the verses. Revelation 12, I mean Revelation 13, starting with verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded. Christ died, was raised to, de to, to life again, but the wound had healed. Okay, dead and alive, it looks like. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. How many? The whole earth, right? Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They're worshipping who? Who's the dragon? Satan. Because he had given his authority to the beast. beast. These people who belong to this dominant church that includes almost everyone in the world are literally worshiping Satan. Satan. What has he always wanted? He people to be worshiping him, right? I'm glad I belong to a small church. Yeah. They were... <laughs> They worship the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? 
and we, it talks about that 1260 year period. And then verse seven and eight, it says, it was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. There's your small church being defeated. And it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. I mean, who's left out? All people living on earth will worship it, Gary, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the lamb that was killed. And who's that talking about? It's people that don't have a woman anymore. Now, I see. Well, it's the Lamb's group on this side and a very large group following, worshiping, literally worshiping the devil on the other side. Can we identify these creatures, these groups? Hmm. Well, We've talked about the ways in which they're similar. It is essential to read the chapter, Revelation 17, several times to notice some very significant details. As we've already suggested, the book of Revelation is telling a story. It is not primarily designed to teach doctrine. Now, the story is about the faithfulness of Jesus, or the faith of Jesus, from the beginning of the controversy up in heaven, in Revelation 12, 7 to 9, we read about the war up in heaven, to the close of probation and the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth as described in Revelation 22. So those of us who believe that God can, in fact, predict and know the future, what do we have here? We have the entire history of sin, don't we? Using the term probation, that's a good old Adventist term. Maybe there's some people watching, I hope there are people watching, who aren't Adventists. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does that mean, probation? Well, probation means a time when people are still free to choose between which side they want to worship. They can worship the devil or they can worship God. And that's... And there will Tim, come a time when, when that's decided. When that's decided, that it's probation, all over. That probationary time is, is over. Yeah. And as we discussed last time, <clears throat> one of the hallmarks of that does come before the end of the, before the seven last plagues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, we note that from Revelation 12 that the story of sin had its beginning where? In heaven. In heaven. Uh, and there's a, so that's the beginning of the story. There's a middle part of this story, and what's that about? Christ's life and death here on this earth, right? And then there's an ending to the story, and, and that's described in those last five verses of Revelation 12. That we, we've looked at briefly. So here's God's story. This, well, the story of God's, you know, conflict with the devil here. And so let's go back and read those verses again real quick, and then we're going to need to, we're going to, need to take a break. Revelation 12, 13 to 17. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he began to pursue the woman who had given birth to the boy. She was given the two wings of a large eagle to, in order to fly to her place in the desert where she will be taken care of for three and a half years, safe from the dragon's attack. And then from his mouth the dragon poured out a flood of water after the woman so that it would carry her away. But the earth helped the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the water that had come from the dragon's mouth. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obeyed God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. So there was a time when a small remnant apparently were preserved, God's remnant was preserved, and then there's a time at the end that the dragon is furious and he's going after this woman with everything he's got. And we'll see what happens when we come back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We just looked at Revelation 13, verses 13 to 17, and we suggested, I'm sorry, 12, 13 to 17, and suggested that that's a little synopsis of the history of our world from the end of, Christ, well, basically following Christ's death to the end of time. Now we're going to discover that, or we already have discovered that in Revelation 13 particularly, and including Revelation 14, which is God's response to 13, that is an expansion on those few verses. And now we're, going to, we're moving into Revelation 17 through 19, and we're going to see that's a further expansion of those few verses. So we have an expansion and then a further expansion. God is saying, I don't know, does God think we're slow learners maybe? Maybe we need some help? Well, read Revelation 17, 1 to 8. Now here we're going to come to something very interesting. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, which, 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 which angels are those? Seven last plagues. The seven, la the, the seven angels who brought the seven last plagues in Revelation 15 and especially 16 came to me and said, Come and I will show you how the famous prostitute is to be punished and that great city that is built near many rivers. The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the people of the world became drunk from drinking the wine of her immorality. What, what does immorality suggest? Immorality. False religion. Okay. The corruption of religion. Okay, someone who is misusing their self to to corrupt somebody else, right? They're selling their body, whatever like this, huh? The Spirit took control of me and the angel carried me to a desert. Now, where have we read about a desert before this? We read about it twice in chapter 12. Who was the first person that went out there? The woman. The woman. And who followed her out there? The dragon. The dragon, the dragon who is? serpent poured out water like a river out on his mouth after the woman yeah to sweep her away with the flood yeah so now could this be the same desert well in greek when it talks about a desert it and it, it's usually referring back to that same one we talked about before there i saw a woman and what's this woman doing now sitting on a red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. Have we seen a beast like that before? Mm -hmm. yes. Where did you see it? Remember? 16. Revelation 13, I think. Revelation 13. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea it had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown. On each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. All right? Okay? So here we have that same beast that looks exactly like that, right? Um, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones, and pearls. Who wears Wears, wears gold, purple, scarlet, precious stones, pearls. The poor? A, a lady of the evening. A, a lady of the evening who's been doing pretty well for herself, right? Very well for herself. She's, she's dressed very well. These, this is, this is the, the, the dress of wealthy people, maybe even of government leaders. I mean, this is authority kind of stuff. Just the color purple represented yeah. royalty. Yeah. In her hand she held a gold cup full of obscene and filthy things the result of her immorality. On her forehead was written a name that has a secret meaning, Great Babylon, the mother of all the prostitutes and perverts in the world. Now, what does that refer to? Great Babylon. Do we have any clues? Rome. Rome? I, 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 come on now, I, I got to have a specific clue here. Can you help me? I don't want to say it. Do we know 
Well, we're in the great city of split into three parts. This fourteen eight. What does it say there? Great Babylon has fallen. Okay, and eighteen it talks about Great Babylon, but you haven't told me what this re Babylon refers to yet. The woman church. No. Confusion. Well, maybe we could look at a different book and get some clues. Um, let's look at First uh, Peter chapter three. Let me just look over there real quick. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, clear at the very end. What does it say at the very end of 1 Peter 5? Your sister church in Babylon. Your sister church in Babylon. Hmm. And where is Peter as he's ending his life now? Rome. Rome. Your sister church in Babylon, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. And if you go back and you look at the end of Paul's writings, he says that Mark is with him in Rome. And so, even my Good News Bible here has a little letter there saying, as in the book of Revelation, this probably refers to Rome. Hmm. This is a Babylon, a cryptic name for Rome. See Revelation 17, 1. Yeah. Okay. So why is uh, Peter referring to Rome as Babylon? Well, because he was there. He was Rome. there in, oh, okay. in Rome, and he's saying, he's writing this letter out, and he's saying, your sister church here in Babylon, remember this is, this is, this is symbolic language. He doesn't, he doesn't use Peter, just like John doesn't use. And why is that? Because if they had said it clear and plain as it was, these books would probably not have survived. They would have been destroyed by the Roman Empire. Okay. I remember when when uh, John was writing this, he yeah. was he was imprisoned, so it had to in order to be able to get out without being destroyed. Yeah. They had to use cryptic language. Mm -hmm. So Peter and possibly many Christians living in Rome were using some code words to protect yep. themselves. Mm -hmm. So when do you get to the point where the code words actually talk about prophecy versus the code words that keep you protected from people okay. getting after you. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they had been loyal to Jesus. You reading from where? I'm back at Revelation 17. I just read verse 6. And not all of it, just part. When I saw her, I was completely amazed. And the word could even be a translated appalled. Okay, why is John completely amazed? The angel asked him, verse, verse 7, Why are you amazed? The angel asked me, I will tell you the secret meaning of the woman and the beast that carries her, the beast with seven heads and ten horns. So it sounds like he's about to give us the answers, doesn't it? It's a pretty unusual vision to be having here. No wonder he would be yeah. amazed. John was amazed about the woman on the beast. Mm -hmm. Because earlier he had seen a woman and a beast disappearing to the desert. Separate. So now the... Huh? Uh, separately. separately. Yeah. So now the, the angels picked him up and take him out to the wilderness and he says, what do you see? What's happened out in that wilderness? What happened to this, to this pure woman? Yeah. That went out here to the desert. And right. Now let's take a look and see what's happened to her. And my goodness, what's happened to her? Look at her. And when she left, she represented God's true people. She represented God's true church. And now she's representing what? Satan. She's still apparently, she's still a woman. She's still apparently representing a church. But now the church is doing what? It's prostituted. Drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they'd been loyal to Jesus. So we are understanding this to mean that Something has happened to the Christian church. Right. <clears throat> it started out pure, and somewhere along the way, it's gotten terribly corrupted. And was there ever a time when one group of Christians were persecuting another group of Christians and killing them off? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Many times. Many yeah. times. Still going on. Still going on in some places. 
but don't we agree that this happens now today um, uh, in the churches pastors and people are diluting the word just to get along or to get certain things from mm -hmm. people to uh, get more money for this for this project and the word itself is not the yeah. main focus my goodness those are stern Charges. analysis charges is <laughs> okay now our big question is this Satan with his attempts to imitate God is this now the same woman has this pure woman become very corrupt to the point where she's killing God's true people doesn't doesn't it need to be corrupted after the 1200 days well it was out in the wilderness. We don't know what was happening during that time. No, that was the twelve. That was the twelve hundred and sixty days. Okay, but the twelve hundred and sixty days. Is that is that a literal time that you can look in prophecy? Twelve hundred and sixty years. Twelve hundred and sixty years. Yeah, from five thirty-eight to seventeen ninety-eight. Seventeen ninety-eight. That means that the woman wasn't corrupted before seventeen ninety-eight. No, it means that during that yeah, time she fact. was corrupted. It was a she gradual was, process. Was no, it says, it, more says more way to the desert. it says to be protected, to be taken well, care of. At, that's what that's happened at the about. beginning. Yeah, but that's the point. That's what's so surprising. She disappears, and it looks like God has protected her, and now sh something happened, time has gone by, time has gone by, and all of a sudden now, what's happened? So God didn't do a good job of protecting her? Well, maybe she made some choices. <laughs> maybe she made some choices on her own. And wandered. Um, okay. Because it says this woman now is, has blasphemous this names. This is the woman that bore Christ. It's the church. The church got yeah. nothing to do but with there was, and I will. No, he, no, no. It says in there that she was pregnant and had labor pains. Mm -hmm. And yes. the, the one was um, born from her. And this so is that was that was the woman that Christ was born the, from. That's that, okay. It's not what came back. And the other thing, the Christian church didn't bore Christ. Christ born the Christian church. Well, hold on. Uh, there's, a <laughs> there's a bunch of things here that doesn't make sense to there's me. There's a continuity you're not getting. Yeah. Uh, there's no, a, no. There's, there's a, a continuity according to a certain interpretation. No, no let, let's let, let, let's talk about this for a moment. Okay. Let's be honest. The largest Christian church in the world today will tell you that they are following a tradition which started from Adam and Eve. And the Bible was produced by that tradition. In other words, Old Testament, New Testament, they would say that this is God's working to his church. They recognize that this was the Jewish people in the Old Testament, and then it was a Christian church in the New Testament. But they claim that, that that's their spiritual heritage right down through. And they will go on to tell you that they, therefore, as the, as the keepers of that heritage, they have the authority to change anything from the past. They believe that the Pope, at this point in time, if he should choose to do so, and had reason to do so, could say, we're throwing the whole Bible out, we're rewriting it new, and theoretically he has that authority. And they will tell you he has that authority because they, now representing the Christian church, were the ones who produced the book. That's why they have that authority. So they produced it, now they can change it if they have the right. I mean, if they choose to. Some churches, including the Seventh-day Adventist Church, says, no, that's not the way it works. God produced those things in the past. God is the authority who's put all those things together. And if we, at this point in time, come up with something new, it has to agree with what happened in the past. Very different. So the, the Catholic Church would say they have authority over scriptures. They're, they have the right to decide what should go, what shouldn't. That's why they include the Apocrypha. They said, we have the authority to say the Apocrypha is valid. Some churches, like the Adventist Church, says, no, you don't. God is the one who sent his Holy Spirit and gave us scripture. And we don't, none of, no human being or any human organization has the right to step in and say, no, that's not true. We're going to change it. We don't have that authority. So here's where things have changed. We, the church started out saying, 
God has given us this, everything is fine, we trust in God, we, we take his word as authoritative, and that somehow during that period of time, this church has twisted around to the place now where it says, we have the authority to go back and we can change it if we want to. Very that's, different. Yeah, that's good, but I'm still having a question on the fact that the woman was the one that bore the child. Yeah, and that's what they would say. They would yeah. say, but we as okay, a, so is there was is revelation revelation um, is it um, <laughs> is it confirming that is that what it's doing? It's or, trying to say if you if you uh, and, and let me let me just try here again. If you go back to the first the chapters two and three of Revelation, there are things and, and there are some good things that are said about some of those churches but a lot of bad things that are said about the churches. You know about the seven churches. Uh -huh. And we take that to mean, clearly it's not just talking about our little Seventh-day Adventist church who didn't come along till clear at the end. It's talking about the Christian church down through the ages and all the corruption that happened and so forth and so forth and so forth. And it got more and more corrupt until at the end, in, at the time of the Philadelphian church, some things happened and even a little before the Sardis, church seems to apparently started to wake up the time of Protestant Reformation. Then it gets almost a pure church under Philadelphia, and then there's Laodicea, and they seem to go back to sleep again. So that's, we're talking about all of Christianity. We're not talking about one little line. So what we found out is during the time of the Dark Ages, the, the mass of Christianity were behind the Roman Catholic Church, at that point in time, who are persecuting groups like the Waldenses who tried to maintain a pure religion. But this, this passage, it refers to the, the woman who, who, who birthed the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And correct me if, if, if this isn't correct, but it, my understanding would be that there has always been, God has been working with a group of, not a group of people, but People, yeah, group. I, I don't know how Small to just, group. yeah. They're, they've always they're, through. There's some people always faithful through the centuries, yeah. And that's that's through the struggle through the centuries from Adam right on through, and you come up here to the time when the Messiah is brought forth. It's been a bit of a struggle all of the way to to bring that to bring that out, and. It's my understanding that's what that's the that's the group that's the woman that it's talking about here, and then we carry on in to find a little bit of the bit of the history. But um, that, that uh, you're 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 kind of putting this uh, putting this woman as as um, uh, as a different group than what it is from the beginning from the days of Adam. There is a Somewhere, somehow, God has had a group of people, faithful people. A few. Fought. That's his church. That's right. That's right. And that's what it refers to as, as the true church. And we come on down here to the end, there's a little bit what, of a remnant. But What I think you're missing here is the woman goes back into the desert, and she's relatively pure. There's a metaphor. How did she get prostituted? It, it, but what I'm saying, Paul, Paul made the statement, the mystery of iniquity Mm -hmm. already is working. Mm -hmm. That was pre-papacy. The woman was starting to turn and then you get into Eusebius who mm -hmm. is one of the only historians back in that era before the Dark Ages and he thinks Constantine's the greatest thing that ever happened. To the Christian because Church. nothing had really happened. It was starting to work. It was in its infancy but when you get into later in the Middle Ages things change tremendously. Okay, well we've got only eight minutes left. Let's see if we can make it through the rest of our handout here and, and pull it together. So back from Isaiah 14, we talked about last week. Isaiah 14 talks about the fact that the devil has always wanted to be in God's place. And in order for the sa Satan who's way down here somewhere to take God's place, he tries to do two things. He tries to pull God down and he tries to raise himself up. That's what he's doing. So these names that are blasphemous names against God, what's he trying to do? He's trying to pull God down, right? By the things he says. So the idea of blasphemy and slander here is misrepresenting God, right? 
Then we come to Revelation 16, 13. What do we find there? The third member of the dragon's trinity is called a false prophet. Okay, we have suggested that that false prophet represents the United States of America. What, what does the word prophet mean in Greek? The one who speaks for God. Well, prophet is means someone Always. who speaks on behalf of somebody yeah. else. Right. In, in, in modern diplomatic terms, that would be an ambassador. And the ambassador, does he speak on behalf of himself? Who does he speak for? Whoever sent him. He speaks for the nation that he represents, right? So this false prophet is speaking on behalf of the dragon himself. So one of the challenges in interpreting the book of Revelation is this. And, and we Adventists have been a little bit guilty, more than a little bit guilty of this. We have tried to pick out specific things and we try to tie it with specific events and we say, okay, this happened here and, and that's that and this happened here. But I think we need, to, we need to back up a little bit and take a bigger picture. We need to look at the values and the issues that are involved in the whole great controversy so that we can see what the dragon is trying to do as opposed to God. Um, Look now at Revelation 17, 17. We already read part of it. Why are you amazed? The, the angel asked. The angel asked me, I will tell you the secret meaning of the woman and of the beast that carries her, the beast with seven heads and ten horns. And we're ready to say, whoa, wonderful. We're going to get the answer, right? Does it sound like God is going to give us the answer? Well, at this point, it is important for us to mention that our Christian friends who try to study the book of Revelation have taken a very different approach to, from what Adventists have, have in understanding the book. Most of the scholars who have really focused on the book of Revelation have struggled with two main problems. And we need to be honest about this. They do not believe that even God himself can predict the future. One. And many of them do not believe that the devil exists. Now we think the book of Revelation is a book that tells about the whole span of history from the beginning of sin to the very end of sin and God is in opposition to the devil and they're in mortal combat. Well, if you don't believe the devil exists and you don't believe God can predict the future, what happens to the book of Revelation? They try to suggest that uh, the most common idea is that somehow or other that beast with the seven heads and ten horns represents the Roman Empire and then that other beast with with the lamb-like hordes, maybe that represents the religious cult of, of Nero as God. And some of the, if you, know, if you remember the story of the Caesars, there are quite a number of them who tried to claim that they were God. And so there was a small group over in Asia Minor where John was working that believed that somehow Nero was going to come, as, as God, was going to come back to life and he was going to do some miraculous things for them over there in Asia Minor. Of course, it never happened. Well, we don't recognize Wikipedia as a scholarly source, but it says this, under the reign of Nero and later of Domitian, the author of the book of Revelation represented Rome as the beast from the sea, Judeo-Roman elites as the beast from the land, and the Karagma, the official Roman stamp, was a sign of the beast. In other words, they're recognizing what is commonly believed. If we're going to be honest with the text of the book of Revelation, there are many reasons why this scholarly approach does not fit. But if we speak to those outside of our own faith community, this is what we will be facing. Let us look at some examples. We read Revelation 12, and in there we see it was Satan's original home, uh, if Satan's original home was in heaven, and there was war in heaven between him along with the, his associates and, and Michael Christ before Satan was cast down to this earth and therefore uh, before he was able to attempt Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and if we trace the story of Revelation all the way through until God remakes the heavens and the earth and establishes his, his kingdom here on this earth, made new, it should be clear this is a much, much too large a picture to be talking about the Roman Empire and, and some Nero recreation. And then by comparing Romans 12, 13 through 17, and Romans 17, 1 8. What? Revelation. Revelation, I'm sorry. Revelation, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We see that the woman out in the desert has become a very different woman. If we believe what, we, what these verses say, it clearly does not fit the Roman Empire and pure Roman cult idea either. As noted above, the beast or dragon was once alive but lives no longer. It is about to come up from the abyss and go off to be destroyed. 
This doesn't fit either. What, how could that, I mean, how would you say that the, the Roman Empire died and came back to life and goes off to, came out of the abyss or something like that? Doesn't it fit. When Constantine decided to declare the Roman Empire to be a Christian empire, many Christians who had just lived through a terrible time of persecution under Diocletian were delighted. They thought that having imperial support for their beliefs was wonderful, and they were almost ready to declare Constantine a god. Look at these words from Eusebius, from, who lived between 260 and 340 AD, the bishop of Caesarea, one of the Christian leaders of his day in Palestine, and this, this is a, not quite the way we would talk, but, and in short, there were promulgated in every place ordinances of the victorious emperor, and full of, remember he became emperor by defeating two of his opponents, full of love for humanity, and laws that betoken munificence and true piety. These verily, when all tyranny had been purged away, notice the Constantine became emperor, all tyranny had been purged away, the kingdom that belonged to them, this is Constantine and his son, was preserved steadfast and undisputed for Constantine and his sons alone, who, when they had made it their very first action to cleanse the word world from hatred of God, conscious of the good things that he had bestowed upon them, displayed their love of virtue and of God, their piety and gratitude towards the deity by their manifest deeds in the sight of all men. Did Constantine think that a good thing had happened? There are absolutely no reservations in his mind whatsoever. He is sure that, you know, that the blessings of the Roman Empire is going to bless the church and it's going to be wonderful. What do we know in actual fact happened? It didn't take long to change. It wasn't long before the church was corrupted by its being combined and supported by imperial power. And Gary, I would suggest that was the original force that led to this woman's transformation and becoming a woman of the world, a woman of corruption. And just gradually, just over hundreds of years, that woman became a persecutor of God's true people instead of a supporter of God's true people. And that's the story, really, at least of the first part of Revelation 17. There's more to the story, which we'll take up next time if you are around for our next presentation. We'll continue. We have just a little ways to go. See you then.